are coming on the air with that frantic search right now for this missing tourist sub lost thousands of feet under the ocean on a trip to see the Titanic. We are just starting to learn who may be on board with time and oxygen running out. What we've just heard from the Coast Guard in a late breaking news conference just minutes ago. Also tonight, just in the very first named storm of 2023, Tropical Storm Brett, just now getting upgraded in the Atlantic. Our team is tracking that as we're live in Texas with millions down south facing more danger dangerous weather after deadly tornadoes. We're also live in Beijing for our team's one-on-one -on -one with Secretary of State Tony Blinken not long after his key meeting with the Chinese president. Why he wants to close the chapter on that Chinese spy balloon. So can you call it a thaw? We'll explain why not. Plus, Ukraine's military raising its flag over some territory it hasn't controlled for months. What else we're learning about its counteroffensive live from the region? And on this Juneteenth, the story of a black violinist who wants to bring more musicians who look like him into orchestras. That's our original later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and late tonight, literally in the last 10 minutes, not even, we're getting a new update from the Coast Guard. Right now, racing the clock to try to find this missing submersible. It's a lot like a submarine. It's now disappeared after touring some wreckage from the Titanic. We've learned about it in only the last 24 hours, with the Coast Guard saying there's only like three to four days of oxygen left inside this sub. They say this search is complicated. Look. Uh, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area, but we are deploying all available assets to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, locate uh, the craft and uh, uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. So all hands on deck to rescue the people on board. Who is on board? We're not 100% sure, but the stepson of this man, British explorer and billionaire Hamish Harding, says Harding is one of the passengers who is in this submersible. So far, we don't know who else is in it or where it could even be. The Coast Guard only says it's looking at an area something like 900 miles off the coast of Cape Cod, 13,000 feet underwater. They're using these sonar buoys to try and listen for sounds to try to figure out where this thing could be. That's a big chunk of the ocean there. Here's what we do know right now, that this is a private company that owns this submersible that charters trips to go and look at the Titanic wreckage. This sub was supposed to return from one of its tours on Sunday. Obviously, it has not yet. That's the concern. The crew apparently lost contact about two hours into the dive. Now, that has apparently happened before, the idea of losing contact. Journalist David Pogue reports that he was on one of these subs when communication was lost. At the time, it was only for a couple of hours, and obviously he and others got back okay. Gabe Gutierrez is joining us now and gave an important update from the Coast Guard. We talk about this race against the clock. It is a race against the oxygen that potentially these these crew and these passengers are breathing something like 96 hours of emergency air in this submersible, right? Yeah, that's right, Hallie. And look, we you sometimes hear in television news that it is a race against time. Well, this literally is a race against time. We just heard from those Coast Guard officials that you mentioned. 96 hours is the emergency capability of this uh, submersible. And right now, they say that there are at least 70 hours left. So the, again, they are really, this is an urgent mission to try and find it. They don't know where it is. It could be on the surface of the water or it could be underwater. As you said, uh, the um, Titanic, they believe it could be as uh, much as 13,000 feet under the surface of the water. My colleague Tom Costello is also following this story, and he spoke with one of the officials leading that search. Take a listen. But when uh, when something happens on the high seas, it gets complicated uh, quickly because of winds, oceans, drift, all that stuff, uh, which is why uh, we've we've really uh, pressed hard on getting aerial assets on scene to look for it. And Hallie, as you said, this uh, submersible, uh, you know, was last seen about 900 miles east of Cape Cod. And right now, search and rescue teams have sonar buoys out in the area listening for sound. This is really an international search and rescue effort because Canadian yeah. authorities also have search teams out there as well. And even New York State is sending a, uh, a search and rescue uh, a C-130 uh, out into that area. So this is a massive race against time, as you said. Alley. It's not just these uh, governmental officials you reference, right? Private boats, essentially. Mm -hmm. Private ships are also helping out because they're those commercial ships are the ones that are out in the ocean where this search is happening. 
Uh, yeah, that's right. This is a, a huge effort and uh, will continue again over the next several days. And this uh, company is using these private boats to help. And they've also put out a statement to try um, and, you know, update the public on, on what's going on here. Again, this is Ocean's Gate. Um, and the uh, you see it right there on your screen. Our entire focus is on the crew members in this submersible and their families. We're deeply thankful for the extensive assistance we have received from several government agencies and deep sea companies in our efforts to reestablish contact, Hallie. But again, five people there on board and no idea uh, when well, we might hear from them again. But this is a desperate search and rescue effort underway right and now. And just so people understand what this is, this is basically like a <clears throat> chartered trip um, right. for tourists, for people can, who can afford it, basically, to go down and to see the wreckage of the Titanic. We're looking at some of that file footage here, obviously right. not from this one, but this is from, from Ocean Gate. Um, this is what it essentially looks like, roughly. It, you, you get on board. It's obviously very small. You go down. You check out this sort of incredible site, the wreckage right. of the Titanic. You come back up. We think Hamish Harding is, is likely on board, as we mentioned, that British billionaire, according to a post from his stepson. There are still a lot of questions on this one, like who is on board, you know, what the status is, obviously. Absolutely. And those, you know, they call it a submersible. Basically, a difference between right. that and a submarine is that a submarine actually has more power and can go back to port. The submersible goes from some sort of, uh, you know, mothership, and that's, that's what happened here, and is able to go, um, you know, a, a certain distance before it can, uh, you know, come back. But again, the, the wreckage is 13,000 right. uh, feet uh, down under that water. Question, how did they lose uh, communication? Why did they lose communication? Is that oxygen still functioning in there? All those questions that we're hoping to find out answers to, Hallie. Gabe Gutierrez, obviously watching this one closely. Gabe, thank you. We'll check back in with you in a little bit. Also, in maybe just the last five minutes or so, we're learning more about the first named tropical storm of the year, Tropical Storm Brett. Look at it. There it is, swirling around 40 miles an hour. It's not even officially summer yet. This is really early for a tropical storm. In fact, this is the record, tying the record, for the earliest ever named storm in our country's history. The last one happened in 2017. Also, coincidentally, named Brett back then. So as we watch this weather system, we're also bracing for the very active threat that millions of people are facing down south, down in Texas and beyond. You see that triple digit heat in Texas, the potential for tornadoes across this area of the south, stretching down into Florida. Right now, we're just starting to learn more about the damage in Mississippi. One person has been killed there, at least 20 are in the hospital. Look at this video coming in. Houses torn up. There's a truck smashed by a tree. Damage is everywhere. In Perryton, Texas, crews are scrambling to try to get power back online, trying to get food to people who need it after a tornado there. The city's mayor telling our team something like 90% of the people who lost homes or businesses probably do not have insurance. It's going to take a while. You can see what's left of what seems to be an auto shop. Our Priscilla Thompson spoke with a 72-year-old man who owned it. He's not sure what to do at this point. Yeah, I'm probably not going to rebuild and start up again. I don't, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. Our Jay Gray will join us on the ground live in Perryton, Texas, in just a second. But I want to start with Bill Karens, given that developing news, a tropical storm officially named. This is very rare, Bill, that you and I are sitting here talking this early in the year about a system like this, this strong. Does it tell us anything about what we're in for this hurricane season? There's not a lot of coalition between what happens early and later. Obviously, it tells us that the water's warm enough to support these storms already, which typically sometimes it's not. But the biggest thing with this one, Hallie, is that the location of it. We don't usually get storms this far off the coast. I mean, we've had tropical storms in January before, you know, in the Atlantic Basin. But we've never had, you know, a storm this far out in the Atlantic for the second named storm of the season. So this is Brett. And you see this big or red blob behind it? That's another tropical wave that's come off the coast of Africa. This could become a tropical depression later on tonight and tomorrow and become our sea name storms. Already A, this is B for Brett, and then we're going to get our sea name storm possibly. Typically, we don't get our second name storm until like the middle to end of July. So we're well ahead of schedule. So everyone wants to know, where's Brett heading? Should we be worried about it? Well, first off, in the lower 48, I'm not very concerned with this storm. I do not think it's going to be able to get to us. I think we're going to have wind shear and cold fronts that are going to deflect it or weaken it significantly. But we are going to watch it becoming possibly a hurricane as early as Wednesday, 
and then heading towards areas like St. Lucia, somewhere in that vicinity, close enough that, you know, the British and Virgin Islands have to watch this, and then Puerto Rico's in the cone, and so is a good section there of the Dominican Republic. So that is the area. But notice the Hurricane Center brings it up to Category 1 and then does weaken it after that, Hallie, and a lot of our computer models show that. It's going to get stronger and then weaken as it approaches the island. Bill Karens, that is good news for the folks, obviously, on those islands. Thank you. I want to get now to Jay Gray in Perryton, Texas, because, Jay, we talked about the potential for triple-digit heat yet again in that state, just one of multiple severe weather threats facing people down south. And people where you are, many of them don't have power at all when the heat's getting like this. Talk us through what you're seeing and what people are getting ready for. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Hallie. 200 homes destroyed here in Perryton, a small town of about 8,000. And so now they're trying to piece together how to move forward and having to deal with that kind of heat along with having nothing. The only thing stronger perhaps than that EF3 tornado is the dedication and the generosity of those trying to help. I want to give you a look here at the community worship center, which is now a relief center, normally a church, but it's a relief center. You can see uh, they've got over-the-counter medicines, a, a lot of towels and blankets. Over here, you've got all of the toiletries, the things that just uh, seem normal, the necessities that most of us don't think about that they've lost here. So many have lost here. Then clothes. Everybody needs some clothes. And, and the, the giving has been unbelievable. There are clothes literally all over this church. I, I mean, every room, every hallway packed with clothes for adults, for children, all of the things that they'll need as they continue to try and figure things out and try and move forward. You can see the baby diapers here for the young ones. They've got some food over there as well, some baby food. Then you walk into the gym, normally a gym. Now it's a place where they're keeping some of the food and water. Here you can see the stacks of water, and there's more just behind this gym. And then all of the food, food to take home. They're also cooking hot meals here, serving about 2,000 a day. So this is an area that remains active all the time, and it's much needed help. It's going to be needed for a while, Hallie. It's going to be a tough go here. Jay Gray, live for us there in Perryton. Jay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So listen, you're about to see right here as we take you overseas, Secretary of State Tony Blinken. He's heading up the stairs for his overnight flight to London after what he's calling a productive sit-down with the Chinese president. It's the highest level meeting for a U.S. official in China since President Biden took office, lasting just over a half an hour. We want to be real with you. Expectations were pretty low. Look at that. That's the handshake. That's the moment. You just saw it there. The relationship between th these two countries are at their worst point in decades, with big issues like that Chinese spy balloon, tensions with Taiwan, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the fentanyl crisis, pressure from House Republicans, trade, the economy all weighing on the White House. To hear it from Secretary Blinken, both sides need to figure out a way to try to move forward in this relationship. Listen. It's in the interest of the United States to do that. It's in the interest of China to do that. It's in the interest of the world. Janice Mackey Freyer is live for us in Beijing. So obviously a critical meeting here between the Chinese president uh, and Secretary of State Blinken. Again, highest ranking official. Obviously, President Biden has had his own conversations with Xi. You talked one on one with Secretary Blinken as this meeting came together at kind of the last second. It wasn't a done deal that he and Xi were going to meet. Talk us through that. Talk us through your conversation. Well, there were very low expectations for uh, Secretary of State Blinken and the American delegation coming into Beijing. They had a lot of meetings yesterday uh, with senior Chinese officials, and nobody was really talking about whether the meeting with Xi Jinping was actually going to happen. It was being spoken about only in hopeful terms that plans were in the works. It wasn't confirmed until an hour before the meeting was supposed to happen, uh, which suggested that maybe both sides were waiting to see how things went um, to see whether that meeting would actually go ahead. And from all accounts, it was positive. It was productive. Xi Jinping uh, was thanking uh, Secretary Blinken for coming here, saying that he hopes uh, that there will be more positive contributions uh, to stabilizing what has been 
a very tumultuous relationship. Uh, as far as other senior officials uh, go, Wang Yi, who is the top foreign policy official, uh, said, quote, China is ready to work with the United States to explore a way for constructive interaction in the Asia Pacific and hopes that the U.S. will play its role as the host of APEC and work with China to enable Asia-Pacific cooperation to return to the right direction. Overall, Hallie, there is the sense in talking with uh, some people on the Chinese side and also uh, with Secretary of State Blinken that they're, they're not screaming success, but they do right. believe that the relationship is more stable now uh, than when they first arrived here. Um, let me play a little bit, Janice, of your conversation with Secretary Blinken here. Both China and the United States, I think, recognize that uh, we were in an increasingly unstable place in our relationship. I think this is um, the start of a process to put a little more stability into it. So, Janice, the start of a process to put more stability into it, it is not a thaw in relations, right? But it is maybe, I don't know, pre-thaw, a step toward a thaw, fair? Thaw-ish. Uh, it thawed enough for everybody to get into the same room and to try to get on somewhat the same page. Uh, the problem is that there are still yawning gaps um, in understanding. Trust is still very low. Um, they're talking about setting up working groups for some of the areas of concern, like fentanyl, um, like climate change, but there's still a long way to go. And Secretary Blinken acknowledged that, that this is just a first step. This is a step towards the first step uh, in trying to get this relationship back on track. But both sides throughout this process have stressed that it's their responsibility uh, to engage with each other, uh, not only to have uh, better bilateral relations, but also uh, because this is a relationship that the world watches. It is. And one of the things that I think people back here at home watched as it happened was the drama over that Chinese spy balloon that was floating across the United States over sensitive U.S. military sites. It was eventually shot down off the southeast coast here. It sounds like Tony Blinken wants to close that book, if you will, move past that, as you've talked about. Let me just play a little bit of that sound, and then I have a question for you on the other side. I don't have any progress to report on reestablishing the military-to-military -military channels. Uh, I can say that they understand very clearly the importance we attach to this. And that, of course, was a reference to those deconfliction lines, those military to military channels that you referenced the U.S. wants reopened. Trade and the economy also huge in this relationship. The motivations from the U.S. side to fix this relationship, obviously economic is, is huge. Also a big motivating factor on the Chinese side here, um, given everything that they're dealing with, right? Perhaps the motivating factor, yeah. uh, the Chinese economy is slowing to a point where youth unemployment is uh, uh, scraping 21 percent and they're about to have another million plus grads uh, going into the job market. Uh, we talked about this before. It's not that this is an economy where the jobs have disappeared. These jobs have never existed. Uh, there are a lot of highly skilled young people still looking for work. The hope is that with this uh, visit by Secretary Blinken out of the way, that the Commerce Secretary will come, that the Treasury Secretary will come. These are the visits that Chinese officials are really looking towards as being uh, the precursor to a better economy. Janice Mackey Frere, live for us from Beijing. Uh, incredible work today, Janice. I know it has been a long mega day for you. I really appreciate you being with us live here on the show. Thanks. I want to take you back home out west now, where right now we are starting to see President Biden's re-election campaign take shape, giving us some new clues about how the president is going to try to hold on to the White House as we look to 2024. He's on this two-day trip in Northern California, hitting up donors hard. There he is with Governor Gavin Newsom in just the last couple of minutes talking about what he and his team are doing to try to fight climate change. Listen. When I think of climate, I think of jobs. When I think of climate, I think of innovation. When I think of jobs, uh, climate, I think of turning peril into progress. The White House is also going to get some support from big abortion rights groups later on this week to mark one year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. The timing of all of it 
it's worth talking about here because right now the Biden-Harris campaign operation, right, not the White House official side, the campaign side, still a work in progress. There's no campaign HQ yet. Only a handful of key staff members are working on the campaign front so far. Mike Memoli is live for us out west, traveling with the president in Palo Alto. Talk to us about what we are reading into from this California trip to extrapolate about the next year and the president's campaign strategy map. Well, Hallie, I was at that big campaign rally on Saturday in Philadelphia, the first uh, political rally for the president since he announced his candidacy in April. But what a top Biden advisor was telling us at that event is that this is the exception, not the norm, that you want to put off being a full-time candidate for as long as possible. And there are two reasons for that. One is because the president has a very busy day job, and that job can be all-consuming at times. You can't necessarily plan a lot in terms of campaign engagement when a crisis might emerge uh, and pull you off that plan. The other reason is that being president is the biggest advantage he has right now. You're watching all these Republicans go out to Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, looking like candidates. Well, the president is the president. That's typically an advantage. So they want to stick to that as much as possible. But as you say, there is not much of a campaign organization in place just yet. And that's why you see the campaign leaning on a lot of its friends pretty hard right now. You saw them lean hard on the unions who put on that rally on Saturday. Last week, we also saw a bunch of environmental groups all endorse at the same time uh, another key part of the Democratic coalition that the president needs to be engaged and energized early uh, for 2024. We're going to see that, as you mentioned, with some of the abortion rights groups, women's groups later this week. And then, of course, campaign donors. So you know what the end of the month is. That's that's the campaign filing period uh, for the FEC. And so the president, the vice president, the first lady, they're fanning out to do 20 fundraisers, at least between uh, the, basically late last week and the end of the month to try to catch up in that cash race. They want to put up a big number, but they're also being careful to manage the expectations around it, too. And let me ask you while I have you, ma'am, and we're talking all things Democratic and campaign, right? Because I had, and I will be candid with you, a Republican source say to me over the weekend, you know, you call me a lot about Republicans. What about the Democratic primary? Kind of laughing, but making a reference to <laughs> this Democrat who may be becoming an annoyance. And I'm going to ask you to gut check me on that to President Biden and to his team. I'm talking about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., member of the Kennedy family, vaccine skeptic, polling at only something like 17 percent, still very far away from where President Biden is polling. But I think that number is still surprising to some people who are looking at sort of where the Democratic Party is and how the president is moving forward with his campaign. Can you give us like a bit of a reality check here? Do you ever hear the name Kennedy from any of the Biden folks you're talking to or no? Uh, he's really only a headache to the Biden people because they think we spend too much airtime, too much time, uh, you know, <laughs> online talking okay. about RFK. And Got to it. put it in perspective, Hallie, like I think this is actually a good reality check, too. In the 2012 Democratic primary, and you might be thinking there really wasn't one, right? There were six states. Uh, of the 50 states where Barack Obama, the incumbent president with no major challenger, got under 80 percent of the vote. He got just over 80 percent of the vote in New Hampshire, the first primary. So that just speaks to the fact that no one is necessarily going to be churning out in these races. RFK is a different equation. We have to stipulate that because he's a, a much bigger name, at least a, in right. Democratic circles. Uh, but if there was a real concern in, in the Biden campaign about the state of the Democratic primary, it would have been that somebody like Gavin Newsom, rather than joining the president today, would That's be already right. running against him. Uh, and instead, he's by his side. Mike Memley, live for us there with a uh, plum assignment in California, friend. Thank you. Good to see you, Mike. Thanks for being with us. Federal officials are looking for clues tonight after something like 100 suspicious packages and letters with white powder were sent to public officials in Kansas. They're now testing to try to figure out what this white stuff actually is. Look at this. You can see one of these uh, from a local like, state representative sending this stuff in. It is apparently not anthrax, right, according to preliminary lab results. It's not a biological hazard at this point. But in this political atmosphere, the fact that anything is being sent at all, that there's suspicious white powder being sent through the mail at all, is raising concerns about political violence. Several of these letters were sent to Republican state officials, including the state attorney general. Dana Griffin is joining us now. Tell us more about this, Dana, because this started over the last 72 hours. It's grown and grown and grown. Obviously not, mm -hmm. at least so far as we know, a concern from a health perspective, but from a political yeah. climate perspective, you are hearing people sound the alarm. Yeah, it's very disturbing. This started off with about 30 letters 
uh, that were reported on Friday, Hallie. And just last night, that grew to approximately 100 letters. You just showed some of those images that were posted on Facebook by two of those lawmakers. Those letters were actually sent to their homes. You have the hazmat crew that was actually outside of that person, of one of the homes, you know, investigating because they're taking this very seriously. I also want to show you just a list of four of the lawmakers that we have confirmed who say they have received a letter. And this is just out of 100 uh, state rep Tory Marie Blue, state rep Robin Essex, state rep Fred Patton, and again, Attorney General Chris Kobach. And across the state, law enforcement officials are working to collect these letters. They have hazmat teams responding so that they can take them and, and further test these letters. Uh, luckily, Hallie, no one has been hurt so far. Dana Griffin, live for us uh, on that. Dana, thank you very much. Tonight, the FAA is looking into yet another kind of scary thing that happened on runways in this country, adding on to the pylon of these near collisions that we've seen at airports. Look at this. This is from Boston's Logan Airport. This is the back of a Delta plane. Look at that. Yep. Clipping the wing of a United jet. Like, it runs right into it. You just saw it as it's trying to maneuver to get over toward the runway. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. But boy, an inconvenience for passengers. Both planes had to deboard everybody. They had to get off, wait for another ride, et cetera. These people are not alone. There have been a lot of stories like this. These either sort of mini collisions like that or near collisions from near catastrophic runway problems. Um, it's all leading to calls for more and more safety standards to make sure that people say stay, stay safe. NBC's Marissa Parra is covering this one for us. You know, I spoke with the Secretary of Transportation uh, a few weeks ago who talked about safety is the most important thing. And there have not been major safety issues from some of these issues. But it's stunning to see. Like, mm -hmm. I think you fly a lot. I, I get on planes now and I'm like, well, here we go. Yeah. Hope we're going to be okay just because <laughs> we hear about this so much. And the numbers have... Um, have gone up, it sounds like, right? Yes, they have. So we'll talk about the facts and numbers, and then we'll add a little context Please. in just a moment. So take a look at your screen. You can see 672 near misses, if you will, dangerous runway incidents in 2019. You see that number take a sharp decline over the years, 2020, 2021, 2022. It creeps all the way up to 715. Now, mind you, this is year to date. So this is looking at January 1st to May 5th of each of those years. And the context here being, we know what happened in 2020. We know know what that did to the airline industry. There were fewer flights. It's important to point that out. But even when you were looking at the differences between 2019 and this year, that was a significant difference. And so, you know, we're looking, that was 672 versus 715. Airline industry is currently looking at that. They said it is of concern. Yeah. And that is why they're putting these measures out there saying this could really help. You know, I love the Washington angle on things, right? And there is an FAA reauthorization bill that's going through Congress. Don't fall asleep. It's actually interesting. <laughs> like, I know that sounds weedsy and boring, but it matters because it would, it would provide money to boost safety app procedures, safety operations at airports, right? I mean, yes. that's the bottom line. The bottom line is in a perfect world, those incidents would be zero. That's what we all want. That's what the airline right. industry wants. That's what we want. Um, but of course, you know, life happens and there's a lot of things that can be done, though, to try to bring that number down. You're looking at some of the proposals on your screen there. I think the big headlines here, Hallie, um, adapting to new technology because we're seeing a technology boom and then more funding for hiring and training yes. of staff members, not just at the FAA to adapt to new technologies, but you're seeing air traffic control. That is something that's coming up time and time again. I spoke to an aviation expert actually not that long ago to get a sense of why that's so important. You look at these incidents, the, remember, the majority of them are happening as a result of miscommunication between pilots and air traffic control. Air traffic control workers say they're overworked, they're exhausted. So if they bring on more people, this might bring down the incidents. That's what the industry is saying, though. That's what they're hoping for. Can't do it unless they get more money from the feds to be able to do that. From members of Congress, we'll see if that happens. Exactly. We'll Chris see. Far, thank you so much. Good to see you. Coming up here on the show, officials in Hawaii tonight are again warning people who live near the island's biggest volcano to get ready. Why they say this thing may be erupting dangerous glass shards. Plus, BB Rex speaking out after getting hit in the face by a phone. Look at this during her New York City concert. That's coming up Oof, in our five things. Tonight, police here in Washington are looking into a shooting that ended in two teenagers getting killed, two others hurt. They're offering more money to anybody who can give them info information on what happened here. It's one of two shootings in the D.C. area yesterday. The other left a six-year-old in critical condition. Both he and the other victim are expected to recover. 
In Chicago, a little earlier in the day, a Juneteenth celebration turned deadly after a fight broke out. At least 22 people shot there, one of three shootings in the Chicago area over the weekend, with the city's police superintendent saying his department's heart goes out to all the victims. There's just too many guns, too many people willing to use those guns to settle even the most minor arguments. These are just some of the more than a dozen shootings that happened over the holiday weekend. You see the map here. At least 14 people were killed. Dozens of others hurt. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. And Jesse, um, these shootings happen on a weekend that's a holiday for a lot of people in this Chicago suburb. People were basically at a, at a party, at a celebration for Juneteenth. Tell us more. Yeah, Hallie, so what we're being told by officials is Saturday evening around 6 p.m., uh, there was a Juneteenth celebration going on, a peaceful celebration as it's been described in a a uh, strip mall in Willowbrook, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And officials say that there were authorities in the area in the later evening. They had left the area to check on another call, and that's when they heard gunshots ringing out, went back to the scene. And this was around midnight Saturday into Sunday morning. Again, this was supposed to be a peaceful celebration for Juneteenth. It turned violent, and we're told the latest information we have from authorities is that at least 23 people were shot. One person was killed killed in this incident. Here's what some people described from the area. Then when the gunshots happened, we heard the sirens, and then within, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, there was probably like 50 cops, along with EMS. And again, this is just one of numerous shootings that took place across the weekend over this holiday weekend for Father's Day, as well as Juneteenth, Pally. It is um, hard to look at a map like the one that we just showed, Jesse, right? The idea that in all of those cities that we named, there have been shootings just in the last 72 hours alone. This year alone, there have been 315 mass shootings in this country. Just last month, it was another deadly weekend over the Memorial Day holiday. This is not just limited to holidays, though. No, it's not. And, and by the way, I also want to point out that 315 that we're looking at there, Hallie, that number is actually ticked up throughout the day. And if you look at our reports wow. on, our, on our website, on NBCNews.com from over the weekend, uh, and just look at the, at the bottom of some of those articles where we have that tally, it has continued to go up over the last couple of days, which I just think speaks to the fact that this is a constant um, in, in this country. And what we have is some data from uh, that the Pew Research Center gathered. And when you look at uh, percentages of shootings and the number of shootings uh, based on, on recent years, they, they have a number that in 20 21, if you, if you average it out, divide the total number of murders, according to the CDC, as uh, attributed to the Pew Research Center, uh, it ravages out to about 57 uh, homicides, 57 shooting murders per day uh, in this country back in 2021. And obviously, we're looking at uh, about halfway through the year right now, uh, more than 300 mass shootings, according to the Gun Violence Archive, which qualifies that as any shooting with at least four people shot, not including the shooter. And I just want to uh, say one other thing, Hallie, we're just talking about something in Please. the Chicago area. I spent years living and reporting in Chicago, I and know. I can just tell you as a reporter who often responded uh, to, to shooting scenes, especially on the weekends in the summers, uh, something that I, I think is just worth pointing out, we're getting to that warmer weather, and unfortunately, that is uh, when we often see uh, a lot of shootings unfolding in the summer months, uh, especially in a place like Chicago. It's something I, I was accustomed to seeing a lot of. And it's just yeah. when you think of that as a reporter, it's one of those unfortunate things we think about when it's really hot out, when it's really warm and sunny out, uh, the possibility of violence erupting in communities. And it, unfortunately, we saw that this past weekend all over the United States, Hallie. Let me tell you, not just Chicago, as a local news reporter in Hartford, Connecticut, many years ago, same thing. You would sort of dread those summer weekends, bracing for maybe what is to come. Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, at least five Palestinians were killed. More than 90 others hurt in an Israeli military raid at a refugee camp in the northern West Bank, Palestinian health officials said today. Seven Israeli soldiers were also hurt. The IDF said it was trying to arrest two suspects when the fighting started, the fiercest in years there. At least two of the dead, uh, two, at least two people had been killed. Number two, a 19-year-old man in Michigan has been charged with threatening a mass shooting at a synagogue in East Lansing, according to the feds. Prosecutors say he made threats on Instagram and that they found a note on his phone detailing plans for the attack. When law enforcement searched his house, they found some guns, some ammo, some tactical gear. 
Number three, the Coast Guard says they've seized an, seized an estimated $185 million worth of cocaine in international waters. 14 tons, look at it there, nine separate cases from the Atlantic Ocean down to the Caribbean. They've also arrested 12 suspected drug smugglers on a number of charges. Number four, BB Rexa was rushed to the hospital after this moment at a live concert. Look at this, somebody threw a phone. It hit her right in the face. She immediately falls down on her knees. It's just, you see the people from backstage rushing out to make sure she's okay. Looks like she is be able to post pictures. She said she's good, um, she's doing all right. Obviously some injuries there, but she will, um, she will be in touch. Number five, the eruption of the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, very active over the weekend. 30 feet high bursts of lava. Officials say it's sending out gases that could start to form volcano smog, volcanic smog, it's called VOG, and there might be some glass shards in it as well. That could float to some nearby communities, that could hurt air quality too. When we come back, the Ukrainian military says it's retaken a couple of villages and it's counteroffensive against Russia, but that's not quite what they were hoping for. We're talking about why with our reporter live from Kharkiv next. So Ukraine is starting to tick off at least some wins in villages and towns that Russia had taken over two weeks into its long-planned counteroffensive. You saw Ukrainian forces overnight raising the flag in a small village in the eastern part of the country. It's one of several regions that was taken over and until recently controlled by the Kremlin. That village, you see it here, it's in the Zaporizhia region. There's been a lot of fighting there. It's not far from a nuclear power plant that's been a big cause of concern for Ukraine and its allies. I want to show you some of the fighting here, right? The storming of the village adds to these small gains for Ukraine ever since it started this counteroffensive. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has said winning this campaign would, in essence, mean winning the war. NBC's Raf Sanchez is live for us in Kharkiv, Ukraine tonight. So let me pull up sort of where this 38 square miles is, roughly, that Ukraine has said it's taken back in this counteroffensive. That is obviously... Um, it is better for Ukraine to recapture territory than not, RAF, but they would want to see these numbers be much bigger, right? They would want to see these numbers be much bigger, Hallie. Frankly, it is a problem for officials in Kyiv that when we talk about the progress the Ukrainians are making on the battlefield, we are talking about small villages. We are not That's talking right. about major cities. These are not the lightning advances that the Ukrainians were able to make last year. Instead, Hallie, this is hard, grinding combat. The Russians have had a lot of time to dig in. Their positions are fortified. They planted a lot of landmines. And because the fighting is happening closer to the borders with both Russia and with occupied Crimea, the Russians are able to bring a whole lot more air power to bear than they have been previously. Now, President Zelensky and other officials have been putting a brave face on this. Earlier tonight, the Ukrainian president said, be it sooner or be it later, the blue and yellow Ukrainian flag is going to be flying all over the east and the south. It is worth saying, Hallie, that it is too early at this point, even a couple weeks in, to make a judgment on the overall success of this yeah. counteroffensive. And that is because we have yet to see the Ukrainians mount an all-out assault on one position or another and really push their chips into the middle of the table. Hallie. I know one of the things you're also reporting on, Raf, as you're there in Kharkiv, is what it's going to take to begin rebuilding some of these towns that have been absolutely decimated in this invasion. That is going to be the subject, one of the subjects, of a meeting that Secretary of State Blinken is going to take in London, now that he's wrapped up in China here, for this recovery conference. What does life in Ukraine look like after the war? Um, the answer seems to be... Uh, whatever the answer is going to be, incredibly expensive, right? We are talking billions of dollars, not millions. We are talking almost trillions, Hallie. Uh, the Ukrainians yeah. say they need $750 billion to repair the country, three-quarters of a trillion dollars. And the question is kind of an obvious one. Who is going to pony up that kind of money when there is no guarantee that the Russians aren't going to come back and attack once again, That's wreak right. all that damage once again. Here in Kharkiv, a city official told us earlier they need $9 billion literally just to repair the damage to get back to where they were in February 2022, to say nothing of the enormous infrastructure support, getting people's lives back together, and getting this country up and running. So big conversation that Blinken is heading into on Wednesday in London. Hallie. We'll look for more of you, I know, later on this week. Raf Sanchez, thank you very much. Good to see you.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the governor of Pennsylvania says that collapsed section of I-95 is expected to reopen within the next couple weeks. That's fast, right? When we talked about this initially, the estimates were all maybe months, not weeks, but apparently the demolition is all wrapped up. Crews are putting in place some temporary lanes until that permanent bridge gets built. Out of our Southern Bureau, F Florida police searching the bag of a woman during a bicycle stop when they found this, look. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. That is a baby raccoon. Police say they stopped the woman for riding her bike at night without lights. They searched her bag. They say they found drugs. And then this, this little guy, the, anim, uh, the baby raccoon was taken to a local vet. It was then released back into the wild. And out of our Western Bureau, check this out. What do you see on the ground there? What is all that? Those are French fries, thousands of them. Because a truck flipped on a highway in Utah. So boxes of fries ended up across six hours of traffic. Hours to clean up, lots of traffic delays. Nobody was seriously hurt, thank goodness. That's that's something that happened. Coming up here on the show, how some folks are celebrating the country's newest federal holiday. Next. For just the third time ever, the country is officially pausing to commemorate Juneteenth, the newest federal holiday today marking the day in 1865 that enslaved Africans in Texas learned they were free. They didn't know they had been freed until two and a half years after slavery was ended in the U.S. Across the country, Americans have been celebrating this day, though, far longer than simply three years. It's been called Emancipation Day, Black Independence Day, or Freedom Day. But it wasn't until 2021 that President Biden signed a law marking Juneteenth today, National Independence Day. Antonia Hilton is joining us now from a Juneteenth celebration in Queens. Antonia, tell us about it. Hey, Hallie. I mean, as you can hear, it is a full-on celebration here in Queens. This is a community that actually started their fight to start recognizing Juneteenth and holding Juneteenth festivals well before the president took action in 2021. There are organizers here who worked with state-level lawmakers to start hosting Juneteenth events years ago. This is an incredibly diverse community here in Queens, a historic black community. And for them, many of them trace their ancestors back to 1865 and well before. And for them, this is really their July 4th. Take a listen to a conversation I had with one of the vendors here who's long celebrated Juneteenth. Juneteenth means victory, it means black pride, it means celebration, it means happiness, it means love, it means joy for our black community. Okay. And now here in this community, a lot of the events, while you see the party, the celebration all happening to me, on the side, there's also kinds of healthcare events, there is yoga, there are children's arts programs. So as much as this is a celebration, there's also a recognition of history and self-care here, people making the most of a day off and to be with their community, Hallie. What's also important to note is that, yes, today's a federal holiday, but Juneteenth is only a paid holiday in some states, but not others. That's right. And almost half of this country is not necessarily able to take a full paid day off. So there's the federal observance, but at a state level, what you're able to do on Juneteenth, how it's recognized looks a little bit different. And when I talk to people about that, they say that they think it comes down to an education piece, that there's still so many Americans who simply do not know what Juneteenth is. Take a listen to a conversation I had with one community organizer about just that. Progression is a tough thing in this country. <laughs> so I think it's up to, like I said, you, you have to stay informed and you also have to promote and more people need to be made aware. So events like this spread that awareness so that people see the importance of this day and why it should be reflected and be a day off so people can celebrate. A lot of the organizers here who work to make sure that Queens had a Juneteenth festival, they say that they know that there are organizers at the community level in all kinds of other states replicating these same events, kind of taking notes from each other to make sure that these festivals don't just continue in the communities that already have recognized Juneteenth right. uh, for so many generations, but that they're able to spread it elsewhere, Hallie. 
Antonia Hilton live for us there in Queens. Antonia, thank you. Glad you're there for us tonight. I appreciate it. That brings us to tonight's original now. In-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's classical music and how far it still has to go in terms of diversity. Right now, there are not many classical musicians of color, but one couple is trying to change that, creating a group to become a pipeline to the industry for young black and Latino and Latina performers. Zinkley Esamo has more. It started over 25 years ago. For me, you know, I was often the only person student child of color uh, growing up playing the violin. As a black classical musician, Aaron Dworkin wanted to change the genre's landscape. Classical music is both for us and by us. Together with his wife, Afa Dworkin, they created Sphinx Music. An organization focused on creating a pipeline of black and Latinx talent. And the narrative of classical music would have you believe that it's pretty monochromatic and it belongs to the Western European world. Today, just over 79% of classical musicians in the United States are white. Only 4.8% identify as Latinx and 2.4% identify as black. Though the number of musicians identifying as a person of color has increased from 15% to nearly 21% in just the last seven years. And in order for classical music to have a sense of relevance for communities, it needs to be representative uh, by all of the voices within the community. I actually was proud of what I was able to bring with my heritage to classical music. Joseph Conyers was in the very first Sphinx cohort back in 1998. Now he's the principal bassist for one of the country's leading classical groups, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and he teaches at Juilliard. I'm seeing the next generation coming up behind me. Look how far things have come since when I was growing up. This June, students at the Cesar Chavez Academy, a majority Latinx school in Detroit, are preparing for their year-end recital. I like violin because it, it had like these peaceful notes. When you play it, it sounds so peaceful. Ten-year-old Donnie Salas started playing the violin two years ago through his school's partnership with Sphinx. His mom says it's made a difference. Programs like this actually help these children that want to play. After 25 years, Sphinx has nearly 1,100 alumni and over $10 million invested in black and brown musicians. Sphinx's goal is transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. The classical music shift coming one note at a time. Sinclair Samoa, NBC News. Our thanks to Zinkley for that story. Sphinx is releasing their first album with Deutsche Grammophon, a leading classical music label. It'll be the first all black and Latino, Latino orchestra on the label. We are coming on the air with a frantic search right now for a missing tourist sub lost thousands of miles under the ocean on a trip to see the Titanic. We're just starting to learn who may be on board with time and oxygen running out. But we're just hearing from the Coast Guard in a late breaking news conference just last hour. Also tonight, we are tracking Tropical Storm Brett just now getting upgraded in the Atlantic. Our team's tracking that as we're live in Texas with millions in the South facing more dangerous weather after deadly tornadoes. We'll also take you live to Beijing for our team's one-on-one -on -one with Secretary of State Tony Blinken not long after his key meeting with the Chinese president. But he wants to close the chapter on that Chinese spy balloon. So can you call it a thaw in the relationship? We'll explain why not. Plus, we're getting our first look at a new interview just out with former President Trump, the first time he's been pressed in a substantive way on classified documents since his indictment. What he said when he was asked why he didn't just hand that stuff over. Plus, we're out in California with President Biden on the campaign trail, but with his attention on a Republican opponent. Is there a Democrat he needs to worry about in the primary? We've got that later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and late tonight, in just the last maybe 60, 70 minutes or so, we're hearing a new update from the Coast Guard, racing against the clock, really, truly, to try to find this missing submersible that disappeared while touring wreckage from the Titanic. Now, the Coast Guard says this thing, this sub, it's like a submarine, it's a little different, it only has about three to four days of oxygen left. The search is complicated. Look. It's a challenge to conduct a search in that remote area, but we are deploying all available assets to make sure that we can locate the craft and 
uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. So who are the people on board? We don't know all of them yet, but the stepson of this man, British explorer, he's a billionaire, Hamish Harding, says Harding is one of the passengers on board. So far, again, question mark on who else is in the sub, where it could be exactly. The Coast Guard is looking at a spot something like 900 miles off the coast of Cape Cod. Keep in mind, the Titanic wreckage is 13,000 feet underwater. So right now, they're trying to listen. Think about it. Your eyes can only see so far on the surface of the ocean or under the ocean, even with radar, et cetera. They're trying to use that kind of underwater radar to be able to figure out where this sub could be. Here's what we do know. There's a private company, obviously, that owns this sub, Ocean Gate Expeditions. They charter trips to go down for people to explore the Titanic wreckage. This trip was supposed to get back on Sunday. Obviously, it hasn't yet. Apparently, the crew lost contact about two hours into the dive. It is not unprecedented for this sub to lose contact. The journalist David Pogue was on one of these things one time. This was a couple years ago when, uh, I guess it was last summer, when communication was lost. That only lasted for two hours. Obviously, he got back okay. The other folks did as well. Question mark is what happens here now. Gabe Gutierrez is joining us live. And Gabe, there's 96 hours of emergency oxygen in this submersible. We don't know what's happening. We don't know where it is. We don't know what its status is. But that 96-hour number is so critical here. The Coast Guard says by their calculations, there's anywhere from 70 to 96 hours left here. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. A literal race against time. And actually, within the last few minutes, we do have some uh, breaking news. Uh, the managing director of Action Aviation confirmed over the phone to, a to NBC News that Hamish Harding, the uh, billionaire that you just mentioned, is one of the five people on board that submersible. And again, we do not know where it is right now, but this active search and rescue effort is underway. You see those pictures uh, right there. Those are, that's the, the type of uh, submersible that, that we're looking at. And as you said, this is a company that charters it out. And the New York Times has reported that some of these excursions and it, um, you know, can, can cost up to $250,000. So it's not cheap. Uh, but again, we're still waiting to learn more about those other people that were on board. Uh, my colleague Con Tom Costello spoke with one of the Coast Guard officials uh, that is leading the search right now. Take a listen. But when, uh, when something happens on the high seas, it gets complicated uh, quickly because of winds, oceans, drift, all that stuff, uh, which is why uh, we've, we've really uh, pressed hard on getting aerial assets on scene to look for it. So, again, that uh, Titanic wreckage, wreckage 13,000 feet uh, underwater, and it is uh, very difficult right now. The Coast Guard and also Canadian authorities are searching not just above uh, or on the water, but also underneath it. It is very difficult, a very remote area, Hallie. What is the company that owns this sub saying here? I know that they have said in a statement, I believe, that obviously they're doing everything they can to try to make sure it's found, et cetera. Do we know more? Uh, yeah, and, you know, the company is, uh, hasn't released uh, much as of yet, but if we can put their uh, written statement up on the screen, uh, we, we can uh, see that, you know, they've said that their entire focus now is on the crew members in that submersible and their families. We're deeply thankful for the extensive assistance we've received from several government agencies and deep-sea companies in our efforts to reestablish contact. So, uh, Hallie, just so many questions here about why uh, this submersible, uh, which is like a submarine, as you said, may have uh, or did lose communication. And now it is that race against time with 96 hours of emergency oxygen. The Coast Guard now saying, yeah. now saying at least 70 hours or so are left. Question is when and if uh, it will be found, Hallie. Do we know if this has happened before? In other words, we mentioned um, uh, the journalist, I think it was David Pogue, right, who said he'd been on a sub, lost contact, and obviously was fine. Was that a one-off thing? Do we know that, like, if it, you know, if it goes down deep, if it sometimes loses contact, sometimes, like, how does, how, how should we be thinking about the rarity of this? Look, at this point, we, we don't know exactly if okay. something like this has happened before. Uh, there is, you know, communication systems that they have. It's tied to a, a mother ship. And as you said, mm. that journalist had said um, that it did lose contact for a short time uh, before. But again, they build in these emergency capabilities to be able to, you know, either 
find its way back to the surface somehow or to reestablish communication. And that is why 96 hours, in theory, could be a very long time. But this ocean is, of course, so vast. It is so remote, um, you know, 900 nautical miles east of Cape Cod. It is very difficult to find. And right now, so many of those uh, search and rescue personnel are trying desperately to, to find this group, Hallie. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you very much for that reporting. Such a mystery. Uh, I know a lot of people will be watching this over the next day or so. Just in the last hour or so, some other developing news as we're hearing about a new tropical storm in the Atlantic, Tropical Storm Brett, just getting upgraded today. Look at it, swirling right here. There it is, off the coast of the Caribbean islands, 40 miles an hour. It's not even officially summer yet, but this thing is the second named storm overall, the first in the Atlantic this season. And as we watch that, we're bracing for the very active threat that millions of people are facing down south. Look at that triple-digit heat in Texas to wind and potential tornadoes in parts of the south stretching to Florida. Right now, we're just starting to learn more about the damage in Mississippi. One person has been killed there. At least 20 people are in the hospital. Look at the damage. Houses torn up. There was that tree that just smashed into a truck, basically. There it is. Mattresses laid out everywhere. In Perryton, Texas, crews are scrambling to get power back online. They're trying to give food to people who need it. But the city's mayor telling our team something like 90% of people who lost homes or businesses probably do not have insurance. And the cleanup will take time. You see here what's left of what looks like an auto shop. Our Priscilla Thompson talked with the 72-year-old man who owned it. He's not sure what to do now. I'm probably not going to rebuild and start up again. I don't, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. We'll get to Jay Gray on the ground in Perryton, Texas, in just a sec. But let's start with Bill Karens. This tropical storm, Bill, it is early to see something like this, right? Uh, for the second name storm alley, typically that would be in the second week of July, not the second week of okay. June. And if this becomes a hurricane, usually the average first date of the first hurricane is the second week of August. So this would be like two months early if it becomes a hurricane, which the National Hurricane Center actually thinks it will, most likely on Wednesday. So where is it? It's out in the Atlantic. It's far away. I mean, it's over 1,000 miles from even like areas around Lake St. Lucia in Martinique. So this one has a ways to go. But it is moving at 20 miles per hour, so we give it about four days, and it should be somewhere near the Windward Islands. This would be Thursday evening. And notice the Hurricane Center does have it going to a Category 1. Not stronger than that, Category 1. They're still saying that this is a low-confidence forecast. It's so unusual, first off, to have a storm this strong in this area, this part of the Atlantic. So that's the first part. And the second thing is, if it gets actually stronger than expected, it may turn more to the north and could miss the island. So we're still hopeful for that. But the best chance right now, it goes through the island and then begins to weaken as it approaches areas like Dominican Republic and maybe even Puerto Rico. We're going to watch these squiggly lines. We call these our spaghetti lines. If you're not familiar with them from other hurricane seasons, all of these are computer models that show us where the storm is headed in pretty excellent agreement on that, Hallie. And I'll just end with this. We still have over 150,000 people without power in Oklahoma and Texas from all the severe weather. It's currently 114 heat indice in Dallas. Not comfortable at all for people without AC. Bill Karens, thank you very much. That brings us to Jay Gray in Perryton, Texas. You heard Bill say it, Jay. Not comfortable for people in some parts of Texas where you are. Oh. No, you're absolutely right, Hallie. It's, it's much hotter today as the cleanup, the recovery really gets into full swing. We showed you last hour some of the donations to help people. Now we're going to show you what one group is doing to provide food. Much needed here. And it's the Mercy Chefs out of Virginia. You can see all of the spices here just outside. That's to use inside this semi that they brought. It is a kitchen, and it is really unbelievable. Today, they cooked in here for most of the day. For dinner, more than 900 portions of mac and cheese. Uh, I did a little reporter involvement investigation, Hallie. Great food, and so was the barbecue. <laughs> you've got the ovens here uh, that they are using as we come back down the ramp. You've got the cooker that's over there, the smoker. Uh, that was running for more than 24 hours to just get things going. And then you've got the prep. So those that can't make it in here and pick it up themselves, they've got food prep here where they're making yeah, these to-go yeah. orders. Uh, we've got the mac and cheese. We've got the slaw. We've got the barbecue. We've got rolls. It's something that so many in this area need. And what the Mercy Chefs have said is that they're going to be here for as long as necessary. They're going to provide this food for as many people as they can for as long as necessary. And again, today, just today alone, more than 2,000 meals provided. And that's not only for those that lost everything here and 200 homes have been destroyed, but it's also for those volunteers pouring in to help clean up 
help get things uh, back on track as they try and rebuild. It's going to be a long and, and very difficult effort here, Hallie. Sure will. Jay Gray, thank you for being down there on the ground for us in Perryton. Appreciate it. So, overseas, you're about to see Secretary of State Tony Blinken heading up the stairs for his overnight flight to London. There he is, getting ready to leave China after what he's calling a productive meeting with the Chinese president, Xi Jinping. It lasted just about a half an hour, came together really last minute. And listen, let's be real here, right? Expectations, they were quite low, quite low. Because, as you know, the relationship between these two countries are at the worst it's been in decades. Huge issues. That Chinese spy balloon, remember. There's tensions with Taiwan, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the fentanyl crisis, pressure from House Republicans, trade and the economy, all of it weighing on the White House. To hear it from Secretary Blinken, both sides have got to move forward. It's in the interest of the United States to do that. It's in the interest of China to do that. It's in the interest of the world. Our Janice Matthew Frayer spoke with Secretary Blinken one-on-one. -on -one. She's joining us now. So obviously a critical meeting here between the Chinese president uh, and Secretary of State Blinken. Again, highest ranking official. Obviously, President Biden has had his own conversations with Xi. You talked one on one with Secretary Blinken as this meeting came together at kind of the last second. It wasn't a done deal that he and Xi were going to meet. Talk us through that. Talk us through your conversation. Well, there were very low expectations for uh, Secretary of State Blinken and the American delegation coming into Beijing. They had a lot of meetings yesterday uh, with senior Chinese officials, and nobody was really talking about whether the meeting with Xi Jinping was actually going to happen. It was being spoken about only in hopeful terms that plans were in the works. It wasn't confirmed until an hour before the meeting was supposed to happen, uh, which suggested that maybe both sides were waiting to see how things went um, to see whether that meeting would actually go ahead. And from all accounts, it was positive. It was productive. Xi Jinping. Uh, was thanking uh, Secretary Blinken for coming here, saying that he hopes uh, that there will be more positive contributions uh, to stabilizing what has been a very tumultuous relationship. Uh, as far as other senior officials uh, go, Wang Yi, who is the top foreign policy official, uh, said, quote, China is ready to work with the United States to explore a way for constructive interaction in the Asia Pacific and hopes that the U.S. will play its role as the host of APEC and work with China to enable Asia-Pacific cooperation to return to the right direction. Overall, Hallie, there is the sense in talking with uh, some people on the Chinese side and also uh, with Secretary of State Blinken that they're, they're not screaming success, but they do right. believe that the relationship is more stable now uh, than when they first arrived here. Um, let me play a little bit, Janice, of your conversation with Secretary Blinken here. Both China and the United States, I think, recognize that uh, we were in an increasingly unstable place in our relationship. I think this is um, the start of a process to put a little more stability into it. So, Janice, the start of a process to put more stability into it, it is not a thaw in relations, right? But it is maybe, I don't know, pre-thaw, a step toward a thaw, fair? Thaw-ish. Uh, it thawed enough for everybody to get into the same room and to try to get on somewhat the same page. Uh, the problem is that there are still yawning gaps um, in understanding. Trust is still very low. Um, they're talking about setting up working groups for some of the areas of concern, like fentanyl, um, like climate change. But there's still a long way way to go. And Secretary Blinken acknowledged that, that this is just a first step. This is a step towards the first step uh, in trying to get this relationship back on track. But both sides throughout this process have stressed that it's their responsibility uh, to engage with each other, uh, not only to have uh, better bilateral relations, but also uh, because this is a relationship that the world watches. 
It is. And one of the things that I think people back here at home watched as it happened was the drama over that Chinese spy balloon that was floating across the United States over sensitive U.S. military sites. It was eventually shot down off the southeast coast here. It sounds like Tony Blinken wants to close that book, if you will, move past that, as you've talked about. Let me just play a little bit of that sound, and then I have a question for you on the other side. I don't have any progress to report on reestablishing the military military channels. Uh, I can say that they understand very clearly the importance we attach to this. And that, of course, was a reference to those deconfliction lines, those military to military channels that you referenced the U.S. wants reopened. Trade and the economy also huge in this relationship. The motivations from the U.S. side to fix this relationship, obviously economic is, is huge. Also a big motivating factor on the Chinese side here, um, given everything that they're dealing with, right? Perhaps the motivating factor. Yeah. Uh, the Chinese economy is slowing to a point where youth unemployment is uh, uh, scraping 21 percent. And they're about to have another million plus grads uh, going into the job market. Uh, we've talked about this before. It's not that this is an economy where the jobs have disappeared. These jobs have never existed. Uh, there are a lot of highly skilled young people still looking for work. The hope is that with this uh, visit by Secretary Blinken out of the way, that the Commerce Secretary will come, that the Treasury Secretary will come. These are the visits that Chinese officials are really looking towards as being uh, the precursor to a better economy. Janice Mackey Frere, live for us from Beijing. Uh, incredible work today, Janice. I know it has been a long mega day for you. I really appreciate you being with us live here on the show. Thanks. So we've got some developing news to get to here because in just the last hour, we are hearing some of the most detailed comments yet from former President Trump since he was hit with federal charges for allegedly holding on to those classified documents he should not have had. He's over on Fox. And in his first real interview since the indictment, right, he was pressed on why he didn't just give those sensitive materials back when he was asked, even with months of requests from the National Archives. This is in a discussion with Brett Baer over on Fox. I want to play a bit of this exchange. Watch. According to the indictment, you then tell this aide to move to other locations after telling your lawyers to say you'd fully complied with the subpoena when you hadn't. But before I send boxes over, I have to take all of my things out. These boxes were interspersed with all sorts of things. That, again, is the pres former president's defense as he's facing something like 37 or exactly 37 federal counts related to hanging on to classified materials that the National Archives, the federal government, says he should have given back. This obviously is in addition to the charges he faces in New York for an alleged hush money scheme. Legal experts have told us that most defendants in a case like this would stay quiet. Obviously, former President Trump has done anything but appearing not just in this interview, but at rallies and other events uh, in the roughly a week, maybe less, since he's been indicted. More to come on that front. We want to take you out west now to the other side of the aisle, because that's where we're starting to see President Biden's re-election campaign come together with some new clues about the strategy that he may take in trying to make sure that he holds on to the White House come 2024. President Biden's out in California for a couple of days. He's hitting up donors, the old California ATM, politically, if you will. You see him there with California Governor Gavin Newsom. And in just the last hour, talking up what his administration is doing to fight climate change. When I think of climate, I think of jobs. When I think of climate, I think of innovation. When I think of jobs, uh, climate, I think of turning peril into progress. The White House will also try to pick up some support from big abortion rights groups later this week to mark one year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. The timing politically coming as the Biden-Harris campaign operation is still a work in progress. No campaign headquarters yet, just a key staff members, a handful of them working on the campaign so far. Mike Memoli is traveling with the president in Palo Alto. So, so ma'am, forgive me for threading some needles here, but what's interesting about the strategy from President Biden is that it is largely silence on the story that we did right before you, which was former President Trump yep. certainly not staying silent about his indictment and his arraignment here. I realize that the White House and President Biden want to look past Donald Trump. They want to show the president being presidential with trips like this, talking about policy, talking about climate, talking about reproductive rights. Um, but 
on the Republican side of the aisle, so much oxygen is being pulled out of the room from former President Trump. Can you put on your campaign reporter hat, as I know you always have on, and tell us how you see these two split screens? Yeah, it's so interesting because you look at the president being in California right now. There's another Republican candidate who's campaigning in California right now, Ron yeah. DeSantis. And so there's a split screen of the president being president, presidenting, while these potential Republican rivals of him next year are out campaigning. And it is interesting. You, you seized on what has been a real headache for the White House and the Biden team last week, which is the constant drumbeat of questions about why he isn't saying more about Donald Trump. There's a concern even among fellow Democrats that he should be more outspoken in defending the institutions. Well, we may get an exception to the silence policy of the White House at events like the one the president is doing right now. He's at a fundraiser as we speak, one of two that's planned today. He has two more tomorrow. There are 20 planned between the president, vice president, first lady, other top Biden officials by the end of the month. And we have tended to hear a bit more, let's say, candid takes from, for instance, the first lady just last week about Trump's legal woes at these settings. But compare that to what we saw from President Biden here today, from President Biden at that re political rally I was also covering on Saturday, where he didn't even mention Donald Trump by name. And you talk That's to right. Biden advisors about why that is. There are political reasons. There are legal reasons. The big one is they talk about what happened in 2020. There was an impeachment trial, as you well know, happening, Hallie, on the days leading up to the Iowa caucuses. And President right. Biden, then candidate Biden, did everything he could to stay above the fray, to keep his message on what his message wanted to be, rather than getting sucked into a, a Trump-focused message. And that's really the plan for now, at least heading into uh, waiting and seeing who the Republican nominee is going to be. And this is as the former president uh, is out with a campaign video from the day of the Miami arraignment featuring sort of people talking about this, saying he's not going to let this indictment slow him down, et cetera, et cetera, reiterating this attack on President Biden about a two-tier justice system, as the former president likes to say. Let me ask you this, though, ma'am. There was some reporting from our colleagues here at NBC News over the last day or two that there are some Democrats who would like to see President Biden be more muscular on this. Mm -hmm. Is that so Can you tell us more about that? Is that something that you are hearing? Um, you know... Is there a risk politically for the for the president to to not be as vocal when the just, uh, Department of Justice is getting attacked by by some on the right? Yeah, the risk as they see it is that Republicans are making attacks on the institutions of government, on the integrity of the Justice Department that they think shouldn't be left unanswered. And one gave an interesting example of how they would per perhaps like to see the president or other Biden people talk about this, which is to say, listen. Former Vice President Mike Pence was also investigated by the Justice Department and quickly cleared because he had done nothing wrong. So that's a way in which they can not necessarily comment on the legalities of what Trump is alleged to have done, uh, but also to defend the institutions at the same time. But the Biden team feels like they just got to stay out of it altogether. Yeah. Mike Memoli, live for us there in Palo Alto, California. Ma'am, ma thank you. Good to see you, as always. So the feds are testing some of these substances that have been sent to something like 100 Public officials in Kansas, suspicious letters with white powder. Turns out preliminary lab testing shows it is not hazardous. They don't think, but look at this. This is what one state lawmaker in Kansas sent out, right? People in basically bio suits at, at his home, um, at their home rather, looking at some of these envelopes, looking to try to figure out what it is. Not anthrax according to the preliminary results, but obviously a concern because in this political climate, in this political atmosphere, Anytime you're having letters with suspicious white powder sent around, it is an alarm bell in the eyes of some. The Republican state attorney general has received these letters, too. Dana Griffin is joining us now live. Dana, um, tell us more about this, right? Because this is something that is started off as maybe a dozen, I think, or so letters. Now it's something more like 100 plus. Is there any sense of who sent them? Why? Motive? At this point, Hallie, not yet. It started out with about 30 letters by Friday afternoon, and just last night, roughly 100 letters sent. Investigators are still trying to figure out who did this and why, but as you mentioned, it's it's scary. It's kind of reminiscent of the post-9-11 anthrax scare, where several people and media outlets and and lawmakers received these letters. Five people died and 17 others were infected. But in the Kansas case, uh, we know at least four confirmed lawmakers have have put out publicly that they received uh, a letter, including some of the, the, the photos that you've just seen here. But it, they include state reps Tory Marie Blue, Robin Essex, 
Fred Patton and again, Attorney General Chris Kobach. So right now, law enforcement across the state are working to safely collect these letters and the additional letters will be tested to try to determine exactly what this substance is. Although investigators say no biologicals have been detected, state leaders actually issued a joint letter talking about that. Uh, of course, you know, saying they're this certainly good news. It has nonetheless been a stressful last few days for their families and other citizens. So obviously, they're hoping that law enforcement can determine who did this and hopefully, Hallie, put an end to it. Dana Griffin, thank you very much for your reporting on that. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, Michigan police are charging somebody for threatening a mass shooting at a synagogue, but they say they found in his house. Plus, a big fire that just started at Germany's biggest theme park. More on that in a sec. Tonight, police here in Washington are looking into a shooting that ended in two teenagers getting killed, two others hurt. They're offering more money to anybody who can give them info information on what happened here. It's one of two shootings in the D.C. area yesterday. The other left a six-year-old in critical condition. Both he and the other victim are expected to recover. In Chicago, a little earlier in the day, a Juneteenth celebration turned deadly after a fight broke out. At least 22 people shot there. One of three shootings in the Chicago area over the weekend, with the city's police superintendent saying his department's heart goes out to all the victims. There's just too many guns, too many people willing to use those guns to settle even the most minor arguments. These are just some of the more than a dozen shootings that happened over the holiday weekend. You see the map here. At least 14 people were killed. Dozens of others hurt. Jesse Kirsch is joining us now. And Jesse, um, these shootings happen on a weekend that's a holiday for a lot of people in this Chicago suburb. People were basically at a, at a party, at a celebration for Juneteenth. Tell us more. Yeah, Hallie, so what we're being told by officials is Saturday evening around 6 p.m., uh, there was a Juneteenth celebration going on, a peaceful celebration as it's been described in a a uh, strip mall in Willowbrook, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And officials say that there were authorities in the area in the later evening. They had left the area to check on another call, and that's when they heard gunshots ringing out, went back to the scene. And this was around midnight Saturday into Sunday morning. Again, this was supposed to be a peaceful celebration for Juneteenth. It turned violent, and we're told the latest information we have from authorities is that at least 23 people were shot. One person was killed killed in this incident. Here's what some people described from the area. Then when the gunshots happened, we heard the sirens, and then within, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, there was probably like 50 cops along with EMS. And again, this is just one of numerous shootings that took place across the weekend over this holiday weekend for Father's Day as well as Juneteenth, Pally. It is um, hard to look at a map like the one that we just showed, Jesse, right? The idea that in all of those cities that we named, there have been shootings just in the last 72 hours alone. This year alone, there have been 315 mass shootings in this country. Just last month, it was another deadly weekend over the Memorial Day holiday. This is not just limited to holidays, though. No, it's not. And, and by the way, I also want to point out that 315 that we're looking at there, Hallie, that number is actually ticked up throughout the day. And if you look at our reports wow. on, our, on our website, on NBCNews.com from over the weekend, uh, and you just look at the, at the bottom of some of those articles where we have that tally, it has continued to go up over the last couple of days, which I just think speaks to the fact that this is a constant um, in, in this country. And what we have is some data from uh, that the Pew Research Center gathered, and when you look at uh, percentages of shootings and the number of shootings uh, based on, on recent years, they, they have a number that in 2021, if you, if you average it out, divide the total number of murders, according to the CDC, as uh, attributed to the Pew Research Center, uh, it ravages out to about 57 uh, homicides, 57 shooting murders per day uh, in this country back in 2021. And obviously, we're looking at uh, about halfway through the year right now, uh, more than 300 mass shootings, according to the gun violence archive, which qualifies that as any shooting with at least four people shot, not including the shooter. And I just want to uh, say one other thing, Hallie, we're just talking about something Please. in the Chicago area. I spent years living and reporting in Chicago, I and know. I can just tell you as a reporter who often responded uh, to, to shooting scenes, especially on the weekends in the summers, uh, something that I, I think is just worth pointing out, we're getting to that warmer weather. And unfortunately, 
that is uh, when we often see uh, a lot of shootings unfolding in the summer months, uh, especially in a place like Chicago. It's something I, I was accustomed to seeing a lot of. And it's just yeah. when you think of that as a reporter, it's one of those unfortunate things we think about when it's really hot out, when it's really warm and sunny out, uh, the possibility of violence erupting in communities. And it, unfortunately, we saw that this past weekend all over the United States, Hallie. Let me tell you, not just Chicago. As a local news reporter in Hartford, Connecticut, many years ago, same thing. You would sort of dread those summer weekends, bracing for maybe what is to come. Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, at least five Palestinians were killed. More than 90 others hurt in an Israeli military raid at a refugee camp in the northern West Bank, Palestinian health officials said today. Seven Israeli soldiers were also hurt. The IDF said it was trying to arrest two suspects when the fighting started, the fiercest in years there. At least two of the dead, uh, two, at least two people had been killed. Number two, a 19-year-old man in Michigan has been charged with threatening a mass shooting at a synagogue in East Lansing, according to the feds. Prosecutors say he made threats on Instagram and that they found a note on his phone detailing plans for the attack. When law enforcement searched his house, they found some guns, some ammo, some tactical gear. Number three, the Coast Guard says they've seized an, seized an estimated $185 million worth of cocaine in international waters. 14 tons, look at it there, nine separate cases from the Atlantic Ocean down to the Caribbean. They've also arrested 12 suspected drug smugglers on a number of charges. Number four, Bibi Rexa was rushed to the hospital after this moment at a live concert. Look at this, somebody threw a phone. It hit her right in the face. She immediately falls down on her knees. It's just, you see the people from backstage rushing out to make sure she's okay. Looks like she is being able to post pictures. She said she's good. Um, she's doing all right. Obviously, some injuries there, but she will um, she will be in touch. Number five, the eruption of the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, very active over the weekend. 30 feet high bursts of lava. Officials say it's sending out gases that could start to form volcano smog, volcanic smog. It's called VOG, and there might be some glass shards in it as well. That could float to some nearby communities. That could hurt air quality, too. When we come back, the Ukraine Ukrainian military says it's retaken a couple of villages and it's counteroffensive against Russia, but that's not quite what they were hoping for. We're talking about why with our reporter live from Kharkiv next. Ukraine is starting to pick up some victories in villages and towns that Russia had taken over two weeks into its planned counteroffensive. Overnight, we saw Ukrainian forces raising the flag in a small village in the eastern part of the country, in the Zaporizhia region. It's seen a whole bunch of fighting recently. It's not far from that Zaporizhia nuclear power plant that's been a huge cause of concern from Ukraine and its allies. You can see it on the map here. The storming of the village adds to the small gains, these small gains for Ukraine. This is some of the fighting since it started that counteroffensive. President Volodymyr Zelensky has said winning the counteroffensive would, in essence, mean winning the war. NBC's Raf Sanchez is in Kharkiv for us tonight. So let me pull up sort of where this 38 square miles is, roughly, that Ukraine has said it's taken back in this counteroffensive. That is obviously... Um, it is better for Ukraine to recapture territory than not, Raf, but they would want to see these numbers be much bigger, right? They would want to see these numbers be much bigger, Hallie. Frankly, it is a problem for officials in Kyiv that when we talk about the progress the Ukrainians are making on the battlefield, we are talking about small villages. We are not That's talking right. about major cities. These are not the lightning advances that the Ukrainians were able to make last year. Instead, Hallie, this is hard, grinding combat. The Russians have had a lot of time to dig in. Their positions are fortified. They planted a lot of landmines. And because the fight is happening closer to the borders with both Russia and with occupied Crimea, the Russians are able to bring a whole lot more air power to bear than they have been previously. Now, President Zelensky and other officials have been putting a brave face on this. Earlier tonight, the Ukrainian president said, be it sooner or be it later, the blue and yellow Ukrainian flag is going to be flying all over the east and the south. It is worth saying, Hallie, that it is too early at this point, even a couple weeks in, to make a judgment on the overall success of this yeah. counteroffensive. And that is because we have yet to see the Ukrainians mount an all-out assault on one position or another and really push their chips into the middle of the table.
Hallie. I know one of the things you're also reporting on, Raf, as you're there in Kharkiv, is what it's going to take to begin rebuilding some of these towns that have been absolutely decimated in this invasion. That is going to be the subject, one of the subjects of a meeting that Secretary of State Blinken is going to take in London now that he's wrapped up in China here for this recovery conference. What does life in Ukraine look like after the war? Um, the answer seems to be... Uh, whatever the answer is going to be, incredibly expensive, right? We are talking billions of dollars, not millions. We are talking almost trillions, Hallie. Uh, the Ukrainians yeah. say they need $750 billion to repair the country, three-quarters of a trillion dollars. And the question is kind of an obvious one. Who is going to pony up that kind of money when there is no guarantee that the Russians aren't going to come back and attack once again, That's wreak right. all that damage once again. Here in Kharkiv, a city official told us earlier they need $9 billion literally just to repair the damage to get back to where they were in February 2022, to say nothing of the enormous infrastructure support, getting people's lives back together, and getting this country up and running. So big conversation that Blinken is heading into on Wednesday in London. Hallie. We'll look for more of you, I know, later on this week. Raf Sanchez, thank you very much. Good to see you. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. In India, at least 96 people have died in the last few days because of a terrible heat wave. Temperatures are getting as high as 113 degrees. It's also super humid. Officials say a lot of the people who were killed were older than the age of 60. Many of them had pre-existing health conditions that were probably exacerbated by just how hot it is. In Germany, check this out, this huge fire at the country's biggest theme park. This is from miles away, but people could see the smoke from far off. It started in a Spanish-themed section of, Euf of Europa Park. Everybody had to evacuate. No word on whether anybody was hurt, but at this point, police say at least the fire is under control. And the Vatican. John Kerry, the U.S. climate envoy, is meeting privately with the Pope today. Kerry becomes the first U.S. Uh, government official to have a private audience with the Pope since he got out of the hospital last week. Remember, he had surgery to fix his hernia like nine days ago. Kerry told reporters that the Pope was in great spirits and in great form. Coming up here on the show, how one organization is trying to make classical music look a little more like the rest of the country. That's next in tonight's original. For just the third time ever, the country is officially pausing to commemorate Juneteenth, the newest federal holiday today, marking the day in 1865 that enslaved Africans in Texas learned they were free. They didn't know they had been freed until two and a half years after slavery was ended in the U.S. Across the country, Americans have been celebrating this day, though, far longer than simply three years. It's been called Emancipation Day, Black Independence Day, or Freedom Day. But it wasn't until 2021 that President Biden signed a law marking Juneteenth today, National Independence Day. Antonia Hilton is joining us now from a Juneteenth celebration in Queens. Antonia, tell us about it. Hey, Hallie. I mean, as you can hear, it is a full-on celebration here in Queens. This is a community that actually started their fight to start recognizing Juneteenth and holding Juneteenth festivals well before the president took action in 2021. There are organizers here who worked with state-level lawmakers to start hosting Juneteenth events years ago. This is an incredibly diverse community here in Queens, a historic black community. And for them, many of them trace their ancestors back to 1865 and well before. And for them, this is really their July 4th. Take a listen to a conversation I had with one of the vendors here who's long celebrated Juneteenth. Juneteenth means victory, it means black pride, it means celebration, it means happiness, it means love, it means joy for our black community. Okay. And now here in this community, a lot of the events, while well, you see the party, the celebration all happening to me on the side, there's also kinds of healthcare events, there is yoga, there are children's arts programs. So as much as this is a celebration, there's also a recognition of history and self-care here, people making the most of a day off and to be with their community, Hallie. 
What's also important to note is that, yes, today's a federal holiday, but Juneteenth is only a paid holiday in some states, but not others. That's right. And almost half of this country is not necessarily able to take a full paid day off. So there's the federal observance. But at a state level, what you're able to do on Juneteenth, how it's recognized, looks a little bit different. And when I talk to people about that, they say that they think it comes down to an education piece, that there's still so many Americans who simply do not know what Juneteenth is. Take a listen to a conversation I had with one community organizer about just that. Progression is a tough thing in this country. <laughs> so I think it's up to, like I said, you, you have to stay informed and you also have to promote and more people need to be made aware. So events like this spread that awareness so that people see the importance of this day and why it should be reflected and be a day off so people can celebrate. A lot of the organizers here who work to make sure that Queens had a Juneteenth festival, they say that they know that there are organizers at the community level in all kinds of other states replicating these same events, kind of taking notes from each other to make sure that these festivals don't just continue in the communities that already have recognized Juneteenth right. uh, for so many generations, but that they're able to spread it elsewhere, Hallie. Antonia Hilton live for us there in Queens. Antonia, thank you. Glad you're there for us tonight. I appreciate it. That brings us to tonight's original now in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it's classical music and how far it still has to go in terms of diversity. Right now, there are not many classical musicians of color, but one couple is trying to change that creating a group to become a pipeline to the industry for young Black and Latino and Latina performers. Zinkley Esamoa has more. It started over 25 years ago. For me, you know, I was often the only person student child of color uh, growing up playing the violin. As a black classical musician, Aaron Dworkin wanted to change the genre's landscape. Classical music is both for us and by us. Together with his wife, Afa Dworkin, they created Sphinx Music, an organization focused on creating a pipeline of black and Latinx talent. And the narrative of classical music would have you believe that it's pretty monochromatic and it belongs to the Western European world. Today, just over 79% of classical musicians in the United States are white. Only 4.8% identify as Latinx and 2.4% identify as black. Though the number of musicians identifying as a person of color has increased from 15% to nearly 21% in just the last seven years. And in order for classical music to have a sense of relevance for communities, it needs to be representative uh, by all of the voices within the community. I actually was proud of what I was able to bring with my heritage to classical music. Joseph Conyers was in the very first Sphinx cohort back in 1998. Now he's the principal bassist for one of the country's leading classical groups, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and he teaches at Juilliard. I'm seeing the next generation coming up behind me. Look how far things have come since when I was growing up. This June, students at the Cesar Chavez Academy, a majority Latinx school in Detroit, are preparing for their year-end recital. I like violin because it, it had like these peaceful notes. When you play it, it sounds so peaceful. Ten-year-old Donnie Salas started playing the violin two years ago through his school's partnership with Sphinx. His mom says it's made a difference. Programs like this actually help these children that want to play. After 25 years, Sphinx has nearly 1,100 alumni and over $10 million invested in black and brown musicians. Sphinx's goal is transforming lives through the power of diversity <laughs> in the arts. The classical music shift coming one note at a time. Sinclair Samoa, NBC News. Thanks to Zinkle for that story. Sphinx is releasing their first album with Deutsche Grammophon, a leading classical music label. It'll be the first all-black and Latino, Latino orchestra on the label. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.